the Cold Omaha Podcast Network. Welcome to Procedurally Generated. I'm Henry Bell, and joining me today is Brandon Bowling. It's just the two of us this week, but we have a ton to talk about, as we're going to be covering the new No Man's Sky update, the new PlayStation Boost update, details on Shadow of War's Nemesis system, and a ton of talk about my new Switch and Zelda, plus a whole lot more. Uh, But first, I want to get things started with what we've been playing this week. And Brandon, as I'm sure you know, uh, we have a pretty big thing to talk about. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, we briefly mentioned that we may be going to uh, the midnight release of the Switch on last week's episode, and we ended up doing that, and what do you know, we got got out to the GameStop, and there were only four people in line. (laughs) We got out there at like 9 (laughs) o'clock. Yeah, and we only had five Wiis listed for uh, sale. Or Switches, uh, but yeah. Or, yeah, switches. It was, yeah, exactly. We were able to, Brandon, using some clever, like, sales guy tactics, was able to bully them into telling him if they had any available before we came out. Oh. Well, I used, since I used to work out there, I know some of the lingual when they say, if you ever call GameStop, they'll make statements like, we have extremely limited supply and stuff like that. When they say things like that, the number is usually five. Well, and it was great because you were like, well, you know... Are there enough for the number of people waiting right there, right now? And he's like, uh, right now, yeah. And you're like, well, how many people are waiting out there? And he's like, uh, a couple. And you're like, exactly how many people are waiting out there? And he's like, four. You're like, all right, we're coming. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all about the play. Like, uh, he actually came outside. People kept on asking about, like, the amount of uh, pro controllers that were available. And then he was like, we have extremely limited supply. And I stand out in line and said, they have five. <laughs> yeah, and the guy and the shot you this look. Just looked at me and said, touche. <laughs> that was good stuff. <laughs> and so, yeah, we were able to pick one up. Uh, I am now the proud owner of a Nintendo Switch. Uh, I got the gray version, so I do not have the multicolored Joy-Cons, but that's just fine with me. I kind of like this sleek style. And along with that, I got an early birthday present for my good friend Brandon, the new Zelda. Yeah, so, we were able to squeeze that one out. They actually had a lot of that in stock, which is good because like that's going to be the game that everybody gets. Sure. Well, and I assume it's a lot easier to mass produce a, a game card than it is to produce an entire console. <laughs> oh, yeah, given Nintendo's like track record, yeah, I agree with you completely. Also, there's probably some people who are buying it digitally since you can download it from the eShop. That's true. I wouldn't suggest it, but that's definitely something you yeah. can do. Don't do that unless you already have uh, expanded memory because it'll use like almost your entire hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, uh, so before we get into Zelda too much, uh, I kind of wanted to just talk about the Switch a little bit. Um, so you, if you hear any clicking, it's just me messing around with my Switch in my hands as I talk about it. So it's really rad, you guys. I really like it. Um, I have to say, I, I've had it now for a full week, and I don't have any major complaints. Um, the... I, you know, I had some real concerns about the controller size. I think that was my biggest concern going in on the, uh, going in with this. And I will say, as a pretty tall dude, you know, I'm six foot two and a half. I've got pretty big hands. You know, I am able to hold this comfortably for an extended period of time. And I have put it through that test. Let me. So tell you're not you. getting any cramping or anything like no, that. No, I'm not. And on top of that, I, I think for a couple of reasons. First up, the the joyce the analog sticks are proper analog sticks on this guy which is huge so when they're, you say proper like they roll they and well they click they not just that yes they roll they click which is cool new functionality from nintendo previously their controllers did not click in as far as i know but uh also they're actual analog sticks that stand off of the console remember that the 3ds has those weird flat like wiggle analog sticks right right it's this just one like has a like button that curve that, so it's like feels like it's running on a ball well right? yeah this is an actual ball uh, ball and like it's a it's a proper joystick which is nice it, it okay. really is important to me that the analog sticks feel right and they feel i'd say good they could feel better but they don't feel bad and that's what's really important to me 
Um, Super happy about that. Yes, and the locations are actually pretty comfortable. You're, it takes a little adjusting, honestly, because the sticks are like the left stick feels a little higher than it would be on like a on a, a you know traditional console because it's top left instead of bottom left. But the, uh, the right and the right stick feels a little closer to the face buttons than you might be used to because it's directly below them. But once you kind of get used to the new grip, it's it's really not bad. I didn't get any cramping, and any time that I've been worried about getting cramping, I switch up my grip because this is something I didn't really think about this as a benefit of the Switch. But this is something that people should really consider if they have had issues with cramping and it's keeping them from making the purchase. Uh, there are three ways to use j- the Joy-Con controllers. You can clip them to the side of the console, and when you do that, the way you hold the console is basically with the balls of your thumbs, if that makes sense, pressed into the bottom left and right corners of the Joy-Con controllers when they're clipped onto the sides of the Switch. And right. so the the weight is resting in the palm of your hand rather than like on the backs of your fingers like it would be with, say, uh, the 3DS. That is that makes a big difference because in the other modes you use it, your grip is different. So you're using like slightly different muscle groups and it doesn't feel quite so uh, fatiguing. Like it gives you these options. So you can detach them both. You can knock out the kickstand and detach both controllers. And Actually, before we continue, how is that kickstand? Because I remember when you first picked it up and I looked at it, I was kind of like, eh, it doesn't look like it's going to work. The kickstand is weird. Um, it's extremely flimsy feeling it feels like you're gonna break it and i could snap it off very easily that said uh as long as you have a hard flat surface to put it on i have not once had any stability issues at all okay Um, which is surprising considering it's way off center it's only a single stick it's pretty thin um but no i haven't had any issues i haven't had any problems with it like coming loose like it locks into place when i'm not using it really well i haven't had any issues with it slipping when it's deployed i really wish it was metal or thicker or more centered or that there were two but i can't really complain because it hasn't caused me any major issues um one thing i will say is the kickstand you ain't going to be able to like put it on your bed or put it on your stomach while you're like laying on the sofa or anything like that. It, it does require a hard, completely flat plane uh, to rest on. But besides that, it works quite well. Okay, good. I was worried about that because I remember looking at it and I'm like, that looks like real, not, ex- not, not, not expensive plastic. Yeah. It's actually surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, it works surprisingly well. I won't call it robust or anything like that. Again, I would love to see it replaced in the next model of Switch, but I'm not. That's not going to be a deal breaker for anybody. I don't think. Not realistically. Okay, that's good. Well, it, it, you don't think it's going to break easy, do you? The kickstand. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to say. If you pulled it past, it's 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 because of the way ki- the kickstand works. It's not like it's not going to break from what I can tell from just like you pushing down on top of the console unless you Mm -hmm. like slam onto it however if the kickstand was up and you put weight against the hinge when it's locked you could snap it pretty easily okay yeah i wouldn't recommend using the kickstand in an environment where your switch is likely to get knocked down but i wouldn't really recommend using the switch in that environment anyways fair enough fair enough all right continue uh so back to the controller grips uh the second grip you can do is the Wii Mote style grip, like Wii Mote Nunchuck, where you have the two Joy Cons just loose in your hands. Um, this is the mode that features the weird, like, attachable uh, wrist straps. So you can like clip them onto the exposed, like, connection parts of the Joy Con controllers, and then it gives you just a little bit larger of something to hold on to. Honestly. I don't like it. It doesn't feel right. I actually prefer it with the thinner controllers. I can hold them really loosely in my hands, and here, all the weight is on my middle fingers because it's like I grip it with my bottom three fingers. I use my finger, uh, my index fingers for the triggers and then thumbs for the face buttons and analog sticks, and it's actually really cool. Uh, everything on it feels pretty natural, except I will say when you're holding the left Joy-Con in your hand, hitting the face buttons can be a little bit like the quote-unquote D-pad that are now four separate face buttons, it can feel a little bit awkward. Sometimes you need to slightly adjust your grip. But so in other words, player two is at a notable disadvantage this time around. Uh, no, because what I'm referring to is a single player. You'd be holding oh, okay. both Joy-Cons. Um, but I'll get to that. 
Uh, <clears throat> lastly, and so that's another different grip here. It's now it's resting on your fingers. Lastly, you can use the Switch controller, the like Joy-Con hub thing, which mm-hmm. this thing is weird. Um, it it doesn't feel great. It's not really heavy enough, I don't think, and it's a little oddly shaped. But it's probably the most serious way that I hold the controller. That or the Wii mode mode. Rarely when I'm doing really intense stuff do I use it with them clipped to the sides. But the grip here is different again. Now the grip is, like, in the palm of your hand because you have proper, like, you know, Xbox-style controller grips on it. So the three grips all use very different, like, they, you're using different muscles to kind of balance the load of the controller. And I have not had any issues with cramping because... I pretty frequently switch between them. You know, anytime that I step outside, I usually just take my switch out with me, so I'm switching modes. Um, I often will, if I'm running my face into the same enemy again and again and losing, I'll sometimes uh, will switch up my controller style because I'll have better success with a different mode. Uh, For example, uh, in Zelda, they have some gyroscopic controls for casting certain runes and also for shooting arrows. And if I'm doing precision aiming, I actually prefer to have it in the Wiimote nunchuck style where you're holding them both loose in your hands because it allows me to more precisely aim the gyros or use the gyroscope to aim my arrows. Okay. It, it's interesting. It's, it's very cool. Um, so far, I really thought I would hate the controllers, but I actually like them quite a bit. I do not have any real complaints about the controllers outside of, uh, again, I think that the location of the bottom left face buttons are a little awkward but besides that i I really like the controller also it has some really cool features um most importantly to me it obviously has the motion control stuff in at least one side of it um but the most important thing to me is i really like this hd rumble feature they make use of it a lot in zelda i know there's some other games too that use it it's where they have like ridiculously fine control over which motors spin and they allow it allows you to simul uh, excuse me to Uh, simulate tactile feedback. A good example of it is there's a mini game in the um, launch title 1-2 Switch where you take the Joy-Con controller, you each have one, you and your uh, co-op player or partner, and you roll the controller back and forth and the motors are so high, like the HD rumble is so high quality that what you're doing when you roll it back and forth is your brain and your hands are trying to figure out how many balls are rolling back and forth inside of it. You're trying to count the number of balls rolling back and forth, and it feels like there are actual balls inside of it. Oh, wow. It's really disturbing, actually. Wow, that's, yes. Mm. Yeah, you can actually count them, and they're, they're not real. It's, it's strange. Um, but yeah, so the HD Rumble is a really neat feature as well. I haven't seen any huge implementations of it in like Zelda or anything, but I see there being some real potential for doing that in maybe in slightly gimmicky ways, but in cool ways. Because I will say that it's, it's a very neat feeling to go through. It's kind of a VR esque revelation. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so really like the controllers quite a bit. Uh, no major complaints there. Uh, the console itself. Uh, Well, first up, let's talk about the size. I was really concerned when I first saw it and picked it out and got it out of the box and was holding it up next to my my 3DS. I was like, oh, my God, this thing's not much bigger than the bottom screen on the 3DS. Oh, boy. Yeah, right. No, it's fine. It's it's a solid size screen. I definitely prefer to play on... um, on my PC, but that's actually not because the screen is too small. It's because the aspect ratio is a little weird. Um, there's it, the screen is ridiculously wide, and so in open world game like Zelda, it's not super helpful to be able to see really far left and right. You really want to see more up and down because there's a huge horizon in front of you. Um, so, you know, take that as you will. But I really feel like that's a game specific thing. Overall, mm-hmm. I haven't had any issues like reading anything on the screen. The graphics look fantastic. Um, it actually seems to run a bit smoother on the switch, like portable screen in my experience. I'm not sure if that's because it's rendering more with the larger aspect ratio of my monitor uh, or the higher resolution. But, uh, I'm not totally clear, but I I have noticed uh, that kind of brings up something I wanted to talk about. I have noticed a little bit of power issues. Um, when I, you say power, are you talking about power? Is in like graphical processing power? Okay. It boots really nicely. It switches between applications fantastically. But in Zelda, I frequently experience slowdowns. Not like game breaking or anything, but 
the screen tear if, as, as a PC gamer, I it's pretty noticeable to me. I know I had you come in and take a look at it. What did you think of it? Like I know for me, I'm like, oh my god, my eyes are bleeding, and you're yeah. like, are you uh, yeah. sure it's I, even I happening? Totally where you're coming from? So I'm curious. What? Yeah. What did? What was your perspective of it as someone who's maybe got more of a like a more of a less trained eyes? Well. I wouldn't say that per se. I was more thinking like more of the average consumer's eye. Um. Honestly, uh, it's hard to say. Like, when I looked at it, um, because, like, I noticed it when I actually focused on it, in my case, in my personal opinion. And to be fair, you noticed it when I was literally like, Brandon, come in here! And you were like, what is it? And I'm like, and look at like this! It, it keeps happening! I'm like, look, now! 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 And, like, five or six times in, you were like, okay, I just saw it for the first time. Exactly, <laughs> so, like, yeah. It takes, it takes time. If you're not a typical PC player... There were times like where it was pretty obvious, like when you had like all the effects at once. Yeah, when it was like raining, misting, nighttime, uh, foggy, and like there were like particle effects coming out of a sun or of a god beam. That was when I really got the most slowdown. Usually, I get it when there's a ton of lighting effects, when it's raining really heavily with some other special effects going on, mm-hmm. or if I'm in an area that has a ridiculously wide vista and any of the like weather or whatever effects are going on. But I'll say it's not a game breaker. Even with my my eye, it's only actually been like bothersome twice, including the time that I called Brandon in. And overall, like uh, it's it's run quite nicely, especially considering that I can switch it to a portable console at any time. Okay, so it's not game. So it's not game breaking. No, certainly not. Especially when you consider it's a single player game. So it's not like I'm suffering for it. Like all the enemies slow down just as much as I do. It's not like online where I get my ass kicked and then my re- connection recovers and I'm dead. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, uh, <clears throat> all right. Power aside, let's talk uh, internet services. So first up, let's talk Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, the Wi-Fi is a bit of a problem here. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it is an extremely weak signal on my Switch. When I sit in my bedroom, I get one bar. When I am on my phone, I get four bars. So the wi- I don't know what it is, but the Wi-Fi does seem pretty shitty. Though I'll be honest, this is nothing new because my 3DS also gets similarly low signal strength compared to my phone. So this is kind of a Nintendo thing, more so than a uh, Switch-specific thing, is that they just kind of suck it at netcode or whatever it is that they're using for this Wi-Fi drivers. Right, uh, right, right. I'm connected to the Wi-Fi now. There's not a ton to do with it. Um, You can register your Nintendo account, but there's not really a ton of stuff to play. Uh, In fact, let me jump on the eShop right now. And see, I can tell you guys exactly, I can tell you guys all of the titles that are currently available on the eShop in, like, 25 se- seconds or less. Because there's about nine. <laughs> uh, current releases available on the North American eShop are... Oh, shit! You guys, they just added a bunch more today! Oh, that's good. They added, Super like, good. another six, it looks like. So, now you can pick up quite a few things, actually. Uh... Nam 1975, King of Fighters 98, Waku Waku 7. So it looks like they added a bunch of like older games, like remasters, Blaster Master. But then as far as like the titles that were available at launch in the main Nintendo ones, you got Zelda Breath of the Wild, you got Super Bomberman R, 1 2 Switch, Shovel Knight, Shovel Knight Treasure Trove, and, uh, sorry, Shovel Knight uh, Specter of Torment and Treasure Trove, uh, Just Dance. Fast RMX, Snipper Clips, and I Am Setsuna. And, like, half of those are games that are re-releases. Um, so, not super thrilled with the game's availability at launch. I, I have to say, I know we knew it was coming, because we covered it on the show, obviously, but it's really, really troublesome to me that there's no virtual console support at launch. I should be able to fucking download Mario 3 and play it on my Switch. Come on. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, it does sound kind of rough. It's just it's just upsetting. I mean, honestly, it's fine. I'll talk about it more when I get to Zelda, but I'm fine with just Zelda. I really am. But it would be nice to be able to see how some non 
you know, uh, Switch specific titles run on it and to see how the virtual console and emulation of those older games goes on it. I'm just curious, especially because I want to know how huge the black bars on either side are going to be so that it can bring this, like, what is this, like a friggin' 16 by like 7 display <laughs> to 4 by 3. <laughs> it seems impressive, though. Like, I think it's a pretty impressive screen. It is. Um, I mean, it is. It, it is. Uh, but I'm saying most of it's going to be wasted because traditional old school games are not widescreen. Oh, yeah, you have a point they're going to be 4 by 3 resolution. So, anyways, or excuse me, 4 by 3 aspect ratio. Anyways, though, uh, so yeah, the net services, eh, not so great. Also, as we covered, may or may not have covered, um, Nintendo is not putting any kind of rush on getting, like, YouTube or Hulu or Netflix or any of the major streaming services on here either, which is kind of a bummer, because that is one thing I have missed, is, like, I would love to be able to watch Netflix on this thing, because it's got a much nicer screen, like... Fucking trying to watch Netflix on a 3DS is a goddamn joke because of the resolution and stuff like that. But on a screen like this, I could totally see myself enjoying it. Especially being able to switch to portable, you know? Like being able to step away or, you know, go to get on the train and keep watching my show without having to do any kind of, like, even just opening the app and making sure that it's got the right time and stuff is a hassle that I am happy to do without. Fair enough. Or would be happy, that is. Um, let's it's see. Nice have, it's nice to have everything in one place, man. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> uh, what else can I talk about? Battery life. Let's talk battery life. Uh, so I have not run this thing completely down. I do use it outside of the dock pretty darn frequently. However, uh, I haven't like taken it on the train yet because I'm a little nervous about <laughs> taking it on so soon after launch. But um, I do feel like it's got a pretty solid battery life. I would estimate that the three-hour battery life with Zelda Breath of the Wild is pretty accurate, three to three and a half hours. Um, I've noticed a couple weird quirks about the way that it works. So one thing I want to make sure people are clear on, because I didn't quite understand this at uh, launch, is the Joy-Cons, as far as I know, are only chargeable using the dock. Or are only chargeable, sorry, not using the dock, but using the, like, when they're connected to the sides of the console physically. Um, you cannot plug the USB-C into, like, any of the sw- uh, any of these controllers, and they are rechargeable as well. So each of the Joy-Cons has their own battery life in addition to the 3DS, or excuse me, to the Switch. And as long as they're connected to it, they are charging. However, there are certain situations... Well, that's not entirely true. There's one situation where that won't be the case. If your Switch reaches too low of battery life, it will stop charging the controllers to try to preserve battery life. That said, if you're someone who likes to use the controller, like, you know, handheld a lot, or you like to use it in the Nintendo Switch, like, weird, you know, hybrid controller that you dock the two Joy-Cons into, um, you'll want to make sure that you're occasionally taking it out of there and plugging it into your console just to keep them charged. Uh, but yeah, over, uh, overall, yeah, I totally forgot about that. There's no port dock or anything like that on the uh, handheld control. Uh, no, not at all. Nothing. Yeah. There's no, no, and not as far as I know. Anyways, I haven't really disassembled it, but it's a hollow piece of plastic. So, yeah. Oh yeah, that's another question I have for you. Um, can you tell me more about the dock itself? Like... Yeah. Um, it's a hollow piece of plastic. Oh. Uh, the dock appears to be a USB hub with an HDMI output. Um, It's literally, it weighs, I'd say, less than, maybe a pound, less than a pound. It's a hollow piece of cheap plastic with some rubber, uh, quote-unquote, protectors on the inside of the dock where you actually slide the console in. Uh, One thing that is kind of cool about it is since it's USB-C, you can actually dock the switch in either orientation, forward or back, and it will still work. However, um... I don't really like the docking station. Uh, the it, It's cool. They've got a little bit of cable management built into it and stuff, but it can be a little frustrating trying to figure out what's going on with it. Um, it's cool as hell that it has extra USB ports. I actually really like that. Um, so you can theoretically charge USB devices through it and stuff like that, including one USB 3.0 port, I believe. However, um, you know, I don't know why you'd be doing that realistically. Maybe because I because I don't think they support any kind of like plugging a USB stick into this the console. So I'm not totally sure what that's for. <laughs> that said, um, 
Yeah, basically all it really is is like an LED and then like a cable hub because you, <clears throat> you use the same cable for the docking station that you do to charge the switch if it's in handheld mode. Um, so you can only do one or the other or you have to buy another cable. Uh, so generally I just leave my docking station plugged in and when I'm not using my switch I just dock it or if I'm doing something really intense that I don't want to do portably I will dock it so that I can play on the monitor. But honestly... Uh, the docking station could definitely use some work, but I don't have any huge complaints about it. It's not like it's not. It's not like it hasn't worked at any time or anything like that. Right, uh, right One right. thing I will say that was a little confusing to me at first, uh, for anyone else who has a Switch and may run into this, is the docking station doesn't have any buttons on it at all. You just plug in the Switch, or you just dock the Switch in order to, like, turn it on. It Like, th- it, the power seems to go through the Switch and then to the LED. So if your LED is off, the docking station is not getting power. Um, so what you want to do is hit the home button. Yeah, it's not getting power. What you want to do is make sure that you hit the home button to make sure that your console is not just fully charged and shutting itself off. Because sometimes it'll look like it's not connecting and you'll be like jiggling the USB-C connector. And in reality, it's just that your console is fully charged. Mm, okay. Um, haven't noticed any major issues with playing it while docked. I know there were a lot of reports that it was losing charge while people were playing it while it was docked. Like, say, you plug it in at 20% and continue playing, and, like, while you're playing, it's not actually gaining charge. That is not happening for me at all. It's always... It charges pretty slowly when I'm playing on it, but, you know, it, it does charge, certainly. I've never had it die on me at all yet, either. So... And I and I will say I play for extremely extended periods of time. Over the weekend, there was probably at least one day where I played for a good ten, twelve hours, and I didn't have any battery life issues. That was both docked and undocked, but was it say, was yeah, pretty much nonstop. Have, so like, cramping. I feel like at ten hours, cramping is probably a good thing. It means you're still alive. Yeah, you'd think so. Anyways, though, uh, <clears throat> so yeah. I'm trying to think. I think we've covered pretty much everything. We talked about power. We talked about networking, the controllers. Oh, overall quality of um, your purchase. How do you feel about overall? Like, you take everything, you put it together. You know, we're not going to include Zelda, but just the console and all the uh, accoutrements. Not How do you feel about the purchase? Zelda. That's tough. Hmm? I said not including Zelda is tough because Zelda was a huge part of why I decided to pick up the Switch. However, if I completely remove the Zelda from it from the equation... And just take it as a, like, both, you know, uh, a couch and mobile console with limited online features. I'd say probably want to hold off on it unless you really, really are interested in Zelda, which you probably should be. But you probably are going to want to hold off on it until there's a little bit more to do on the eShop, like more options for games, a little more options for, like, streaming and stuff like that. And, you know, just overall, I think there's probably some firmware updates, like for the Wi-Fi and stuff, that could improve this thing. I'd say it's certainly not a lost cause. This isn't a case of, like, well, this hardware is, like, garbage and shouldn't be used. It's more just a case of, like, I don't know that the firmware and software are quite there yet. Okay. But I don't regret it. I certainly don't regret my purchase. That's super good. That's really good. I'm glad you're at least enjoying it. Um, My only other question would be, aside from that, um, aside from the quality of the purchase, um, gosh, just on the tip of my tongue, I totally forgot. While you're thinking, I will mention that sound quality is very solid from the internal speakers. And... um, pretty good from the external speakers it's a little annoying i use um a i just plug my like uh three and 3.5 millimeter jack like audio jack directly into the top of the switch because i don't have uh speakers plugged into my computer monitor that i use for my hdmi output um and because i do it that way i have to use the switch's built-in volume control and i feel like it could have a little bit more range like for outputs, oh, but that okay. could be down to my speaker setup. It's kind of hard to say. Okay. Oh, I, I actually remember now. How's the UI? Like, how is it is access like settings for the switch itself? It's crisp. It's slick. It feels like a different company than Nintendo designed it. When you consider that on the 3DS, if I'm playing Animal Crossing and I want to go take a quick look and see if there's like any DLC on the eShop. I have to close out of Animal Crossing entirely and open the eShop app. Then, when I want to go to, 
let's say, my Nintendo account from the eShop page, or let's say I want to change my device settings while I'm still browsing the eShop, I had to close out of the eShop entirely to open the settings application. Wow. Yeah, and so all of that shit is gone. Now it is a proper, almost Android-style user interface. Um, It's very snappy and responsive. Uh, I have... I don't think I've ever, since my Switch hasn't died and I haven't turned it off, technically Zelda has been running in the background for a week now, and it has always literally resumed to the exact moment that I put it into sleep mode. Um, it's not like I reload in an, in that zone or something like that. It's literally like if there was a sound effect halfway through playing when I put it in sleep mode, the next day when I bring it back out, the sound effect finishes playing. Yeah, super nice. It's really, actually, the user interface is maybe one of my favorite parts. Also, they did their traditional Nintendo thing with polish in terms of, like, the sound effects and stuff. I love the sounds it makes when I, like, clip my controllers in and stuff like that. There we go. Overall... It it does does sound tactile. Overall, if you're chomping chomping at the bit for this and you're just waiting for it to come into stock, I'd say pick it up. If you are... On the fence because of either money, the games library, or some of the network type issues, I'd say probably either hold off till it drops about fifty dollars or until some of these services or updates get rolled out. Okay. Now, all of that was in a vacuum from what I want to talk about now. And that is Zelda Breath of the Wild. Holy fucking shit, you guys. This game is so fucking good, I can't even believe it. Like, get ready to get hype. Because, <laughs> Jesus Christ, you guys. This get may be... To get hype, Dude, it sounds like the beginning of an MMA match. I'm say, this may be the best game I've ever played. It's so good. I absolutely adore it. It is in my top two, maybe my favorite Zelda games of all time. In my top three, maybe my top video game of all time. It is, and I'm only, I'm about 45 or so hours in, I'd say. No, more than that. Let's see, I've been playing it for a week. I'm probably close to like 50 hours in, I'd say. And I'm, I've am i done uh, half of the dungeons, shall we say. And I'm just, I just, I can't even stop. I can't slow down. I'm thinking about it when I'm at work. I'm having a blast playing it. I'm talking about it with all my friends who have it. Like, it's... So, so fun. It is... Well, why don't I give you guys a little bit of background on it. So, Zelda Breath of the Wild is an open-world take or reimagining of a Zelda game. It's really cool. Uh, I'm not going to get into the story uh, too much because it's really, really good. But the just a really brief summary of like the opening cutscene is... A hundred years ago, Ganon successfully felled Hyrule and almost completely took over the entire like landscape and everything. However, and uh, Link fails to protect Princess Zelda. And because of this, Zelda is uh <clears throat> traps Ganon for a hundred years while Link is brought to a shrine of resurrection, an ancient Sheikah shrine, which brings him back to life a hundred years later. You wake up with no memory of who you are or what you did, and have to try and stop Ganon because he is about to break the seal that Zelda has put on him. Um, it is really interesting, you guys. It, it, it's so different from what you'd expect from a Zelda game. This game is kind of like a mashup of, like, this is, this is just really rough to give you guys an idea, but kind of like Dark Souls meets Skyrim meets, gosh, I don't even know, maybe Assassin's Creed a little bit? It's so good. It, it's um, completely open world. It's a massive map, and it is gorgeous, the presentation. They, the graphic style are kind of a mishmash of, like, Wind Waker, Twilight Princess kind of thing, where it's kind of cell shaded but a little bit of a more artistic, uh, serious take on it than the kind of cartoony Wind Waker style. And overall, like... Graphically, it's gorgeous. Like in terms of the landscapes and stuff they show, in terms of like the the way <clears throat> the way that you like unlock the map, it's very traditional Assassin's Creed style where you have to climb a tower and it like reveals that section of the map. But the views from these towers, you guys, oh my god, it just it's just really really cool. It's in, it's by far my favorite imagining of Hyrule. Um, gameplay is incredibly solid. 
when I'm not fighting enemies with a variety of weapons, I am shield surfing down mountainsides, jumping off cliffs, and then gliding like across a river before I land on my feet and jump on a horse. Like it's it's really good. Um, the traversal is fantastic. You can climb literally anything. Like you can climb the side of a building. You can climb a tree. You can climb a mountain. If you have enough stamina, which you constantly lose stamina while climbing, you can just climb as long as you want to, which is really, really cool. It, it really lets you approach things from any angle. I think the best way I can describe the emergent gameplay this game presents by giving you so many options would be to tell you guys a quick little story about a shrine that I was doing yesterday. So the shrines are just like little mini dungeons, basically. It's like you get one Think one well-designed Zelda puzzle that you have to solve, one or two that you have to solve, and then you get a little reward at the end. And they're dotted everywhere. So one of the shrines I did, one of like a hundred or something, was one where you had to complete a circuit by putting a a metal object in between two, a a powered circuit and an unpowered circuit. It's basically just to get, to conduct the electricity to the next circuit. I had solved several stages of the puzzle, but I got to a point where there were too many circuits and not enough barrels for me to continue, and I couldn't figure out how to get to the last barrel that was behind a locked door. I spent about half an hour on it, getting really annoyed because I just couldn't figure out the puzzle, and finally, in a bout of rage, uh, ended up throwing my weapon across the room, because you can throw melee weapons in this game by tapping right bumper. I did this and noticed that there was electricity crackling along my sword, and I went... No, they wouldn't let you do that, would they? So I went and I picked back up my longsword, deliberately threw it between the two circuits that I needed to connect, and lo and behold, I solved the puzzle and moved out without having to unlock that other door. (laughs) (laughs) How cool is that? I mean, that is really rad. I love that. It's thinking outside of the box. You have no idea how rewarding it is to come up with a solution that is the wrong solution and have it work. It is just really, really fun. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's got huge replayability for that reason. And it also just is something that I think everyone should try because it's just like, if you think differently from your friends, you can have a totally different experience there. I'm, I'm playing side by side with another one of my friends and constantly hearing that they are doing things completely differently from me, even the same, you know, uh, puzzles and stuff they solve in different ways, which I just think is really, really neat. That's nice. Um, so that aside, the emergent gameplay and how great that is aside, uh, let's talk about combat really quick here. So combat is the traditional Zelda style. It uses Z targeting and all that. And also, um, uses the, you can turn this off, but it also uses the gyroscopic controls for aiming like your bow and arrow, for example. You're, you're going to have to explain that one a bit more. Uh, so it's like on the Wii U where motion controls aim your, like move the reticle of your bow. And that's all you and you can only use motion controls? No, you can also use sorry, I should clarify, you're right. Uh you can use the right analog stick as well. And then the idea I think is that you'd use the right analog stick for like large movement and then you'd do fine controlled movement with the gyroscope. Um that said, it's kinda hit or miss if it works. I find that when it's clipped in the controller, it's not very accurate, however, or when it's clipped to the side of the console. However, when I'm holding it loose in my hand, it's pretty solid. So hard to say. Um, but you can turn it off. So if you're not into that, you can always just switch it off. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm, having a hard, I'm having a hard time getting, cause I've never owned a Nintendo console. So when you say like, and I also mean, like it's, it's you, it, the red, I mean, think of, you see a crosshair on the screen and when you move the controller left, it moves left. It's like six axis control on the PlayStation. Yeah. But usually it's just like in one device like it sounds like it kind of seems off center when it's in the controller dock no i think you're misunderstanding um the only the right joy con has motion control from what i okay. understand or at least has motion sensing uh the right joy con is the only one that's relevant for aiming and stuff in the zelda game which is probably why it doesn't work well when it's connected to the console or the controller block okay because only the right like i'm thinking it's the whole piece in my head but it's really only the right side of it that's relevant okay Anyways, though, um, the biggest change in the combat is certainly that they've gone Dark Souls style with the weapons. That shit breaks a lot (laughs) and fast. I mean, I've probably gone through close to six, seven hundred weapons in my playthrough so far. 
Um, weapons, so uh, melee weapons, which can include uh, bats, sp- sp- uh, excuse me, spears, uh, tridents, swords, uh, boomerangs, all kinds of really cool variety of melee weapons. All of those can be broken. Shields can all be broken, and bows can all be broken, and they just break from use. So, and what about clo- and clothing? Clothing does not break. Okay, thank God. Yes. Uh, there's nobody wants to see you here. There's nobody <laughs> wants to see Link without his pants on. It'd be kind of weird. Well... Maybe don't play this game then, but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into it. But uh, yeah, so <clears throat> the combat, that's probably the biggest change is that, you know, you'll be mid-combo, your weapon will explode, and you'll have to really quick bring up the quick menu, which fortunately pauses time, but you'll have to really quick bring up the quick menu and equip a new sword, shield, bow, whatever just shattered so that you can get right back in the combat. And so you're usually carrying around, like, at any given time, six or so bows, six or so shields, and, like, eight or so weapons, uh, but that's going to be variable based on how you upgrade your, like, carrying capacities. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, trying to think. That pretty much does it for combat, except that I will say they've... Well, not entirely. They've added in um, some new mechanics. Like, there are enemies that are these... They're, like, archer spies who will... They'll stand... Or archer scouts, rather, who will sit up on top of, like, a tower... And if they spot you, they blow a horn, which will call all of the nearby enemies to come attack you. Um, and this is important because this Zelda has rolled out an entirely new system to Zelda. A, a again, very Dark Souls style, stealth system. Uh, you can now crouch, and when you move, there's a little uh, waveform in the bottom right corner of the screen by your uh, <clears throat> minimap that shows your relative sound you're making based on the equipment you, you have equipped and how fast you're moving. And if you can sneak up behind unaware enemies, it lets you backstab them. <laughs> like, and it oh, does okay. massive damage. I mean, just like Dark Souls. It does massive damage, doesn't always kill them in one shot, but is a huge, great way to open combat. So stealth is a thing in this game, too. And you can certainly take down a lot of uh, groups of enemies individually by just picking them off one at a time. Uh, especially because enemies actually will inspect an area if they, like, catch a glimpse of you, like, very much Assassin's Creed style, where they have, like, a question mark above their head that slowly fills up as they're watching you. But, actually, it's really more like Elder Scrolls style. Anyways, though, uh, if you, like, get in their field of vision, they get the question mark above their head, and then you move out of it, they will come and look for you in that area so using that you can like manipulate groups uh, to separate and stuff like that to take guys out one at a time so stealth is really solid melee combat is really solid um traversal is really solid what else can we talk about uh let's talk about uh level design so this game has eschewed the traditional zelda style of uh, op- uh, excuse me, overworld dungeon, overworld, like dungeon, overworld dungeon. Instead, the way this works is there's the overworld dungeons can be tackled in any order. And in addition to the dun- dungeons, there's these supplementary areas called the shrines, which is what I was talking about earlier, which are like smaller mini dungeons that are just like one or two puzzles or a single combat challenge or something like that. Right, 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 right. right. The, the the design of these things is fantastic. Almost every single time I complete a puzzle, I'm like, oh, man, I'm so smart. Or like, oh, I feel real clever figuring that out. <laughs> Almost never do I get frustrated. I sometimes get stuck. But here's the thing. This is a 100 – this is a truly open world game. You can just leave. It's not required. There's no order. You can leave and come back in a week or never, you know? And so – Another, that's just another fantastic feature of, about the game. Like, honestly, I'm trying to think if I have any complaints about this game. Um, while I think on that, let's talk about cooking. <laughs> no, we're talking about the game, guys, not, not actual real-life cooking. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, so... <laughs> you you, you kind of left that one off where we were just like, okay, now we're going to talk about how what I did for lunch this week. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so I that's had a burrito. I mean. No, just kidding. Um, so in... Zelda, they've added in a cooking system. This is totally new. The cooking has never been a thing in Zelda. They, at least like, as far as I know. Like what you see in, in uh, Fallout 4? Or is uh, it just like something completely different? No, it's way cuter and more fun than that. It's like you have like a you have a pot or like a uh, uh, sort of a yeah a pot that's sitting on top of a fire, and you you just collect ingredients as you're going around. And you've seen how how wide 
uh, ranging the ingredients are. You know, I collect frogs and bugs to make elixir- elixirs, but I'm also gathering mushrooms, apples, um, you know, different kinds of herbs and stuff like that, and you use them to cook different kinds of foods. For example, I found that if I combine Hillian rice, which I can get from vendors or from some farms, with rock salt, which you mine from ore nodes, I'll get a rice ball. And I can use combine the rice balls with certain special foods that will give it an additional buff, such as uh, five minutes of uh, increased stealth or increased damage or increased defense or hot or cold resistance. Which brings me to another facet of this game, climate. Um, so traditionally, Zelda has always had some level of like, well, not always, but often had some level of like, you need the red tunic to go to the hot place and the blue tunic to go to the cold place. This one takes that and cranks it to 11. Um, <clears throat> based on the time of day, the altitude, and the like, climate of the region you're in, you have a temperature gauge that is constantly visible down by your mini-map. And you will start taking damage if you get too hot or too cold, and it will fucking kill you. And so, to mitigate that, you can do a combination of wearing certain clothing that will provide more warmth or provide more breathability, depending on if it's too hot or too cold. And you can also cook, like, certain kinds of stews and stuff like that, or freeze certain kinds of foods that when you eat them, they will heat you up or cool you down for a set amount of time. So they have that going for it as well. I mean, geez, I'm still trying to think of a complaint I can give for this game. The gyroscope controls are a little annoying. If you don't know, you can turn them off, I guess. Um... Yeah, there's massive enemy variety, and the designs are really wide-ranging. I've fought everything from the traditional, like, Moblins and Bokoblins to things called, like, I think it's Hydraxes. Like, they're these massive-looking Moblins that are literally, like, three stories, four stories tall um, and are really fun to fight. I fought a platypus the size of a fucking dump truck that burrows <laughs> through the desert. Uh, uh, that's funny. There are mini. Sorry, bo- sorry. I'm just gonna. St- I fought a platypus. You heard me. You shark. heard me with fangs. <laughs> and he swims through the desert like a shark in water. Oh yeah, I have an example about that with my game. We'll talk about that soon. Jesus. Oh my gosh. But uh, yeah. So huge variety of enemy designs. They all have totally different mechanics. You're not just spamming to kill guys. You're actually like. Oh, you know, at this point I want to shoot him with an arrow to stun him. Or, like, this enemy has one giant eyeball that I shoot at and that'll get him into melee range or, you know, etc. That Hydrax I was talking about or whatever it's called, the really, really big enemy, that dude is wearing a necklace of weapons. So if the combat goes on too long or if you sneak up on him while he's sleeping, you can steal a bunch of additional melee weapons off of his necklace and use those against him. That's dope. It's really cool, you guys. This game is really, really fun. Did I mention you can surf on your shield? Because I feel like I need to highlight that. You can fucking surf down the side of a goddamn mountain on your shield. Does it, it doesn't hurt the weapon? Uh... Yeah, it does. Aww. No, it's fine. I just carry, like, a couple throwaway shields on me that I surf on at any given time. And then I have a couple shields that I carry on me for combat. So and it's worth it, dude. Shield, this is my surfing shield because sometimes I just got to bro it out with my bros. Dude, you surfing. don't understand how it feels shield. so good. They did a really good job on it. So, like, it feels very fun to shield surf. I really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is Also, like you can be Legolas. Bro, D- did I mention like, you? No, 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 no. This is being a nerd, <laughs> dude. You can be fucking Legolas. Next you can. You know no, shut like, up for a sec, Brandon. Listen. Shut up for a second. Listen to what I'm I'm trying to tell you, okay? <laughs> Fucking, I can ride down the side of a mountain on my shield while shooting dudes in the face with arrows. I am Legolas. This is not bro. This is ultimate nerditude. Wait, did he ever, he surfed on a shield? Yes, famously oh. in the Battle of Helm's Deep. Oh, I wouldn't know. I, watch, I, I don't remember all the movies. Get out of here. Them. Now who's the bro? Yeah, he hasn't even like, seen all of the Lord of the Rings one. movies. I watched the first half of The Hobbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not as far as I've gone. Though it's not, doesn't even count. Hobbit's garbage. Anyways, though, so, so um, shield surfing is really rad. They have a variety of different mounts you can ride. Uh, I'll just talk about horses, but there's some other really cool original ones that I'll let you guys find for yourselves. Um, with the horses, all horses in the game are wild no epona in this one or actually epona is in it but you need to use an amiibo to get her um but the horses you do find 
are just wild horses with variable stats. Like some of them have higher stamina, some have higher acceleration, I guess. I don't know. Do horses have acceleration? Some of them are faster, some of them are slower, etc. And you find a wild horse, sneak up on it, jump on its back, break it, which really just entails telling it it's a good horse like three or four times, and then ride it back to get it registered at a stable, and then you can like call it to any stable. In addition to that, you can now call your horse by like whistling. And you guys, it's really cool. Um, the way it works is like the horse will actually run to you from wherever you left it. It doesn't just like teleport to just off screen. So you can watch it running towards you on the mini map. I called it from a mountainside. The way I found this out was I called it when I was on the side of a mountain, but I was like, I'm not that far from it. Like maybe I can summon it. So I hit the down on the face pad on the left side of the joy con and whistled and watched my horse run down the mountain across the river from me, following the path all the way down, come across the bridge, and then run up the mountain I was on and stop right next to me. I was just like, okay, that's really cool. That is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, overall, you guys, I mean, in case you can't tell, I mean, I'm fucking in love with this game. I, I don't really have any complaints. The localization is fucking hilarious. NPCs are, Nintendo's NPCs are really funny and cute they have memorable quirks as always the character design is fucking fantastic i laugh all the time at this game i had a i had a lady who i was talking to who asked me if i'd ever met her son before and i was just kind of speeding through the chat and i just hit yes by accident she was just like oh well you have to tell him i said hello next time you see him i was like well shit what if her son's for a quest or something so i went back and i talked to her again and i was like you know she goes oh have you met my son before and i'm like no because I, I, I'm hoping maybe she'll tell me where he is so I can, like, figure out if it's part of a quest. And she goes, oh, well, maybe you'll meet him someday. And then, in parentheses, it says, but didn't you just say that you've already met him? <laughs> I was like, oh, damn. I just got called out by a Nintendo NPC. I know that that's something we've seen more common in the advent of games like Undertale and stuff like that, but seeing that come from a major Nintendo title made me smile. Just having an having them bother to have the NPC have additional dialogue if you contradict yourself. <laughs> That's funny. But uh, yeah, really, I could go on and on and on about this game. It is fantastic. I highly recommend it. You asked me before would I buy the Switch in a vacuum, and I said that I might have trouble. If you asked me would I recommend a Switch with Zelda in mind, I'd say get a fucking Switch. It's so good. It is such a fun game. I'm the reason that I'm okay with them not having much of an online library right now is because it's Zelda is just so good. I'm going to play all the way through it. I probably have easily another 50 or 60 hours in it. This game is huge. And when I finish it, I'll probably just start over again because maybe I'll do it in a different order. Maybe I'll do what I what they talked about in the previews and literally walk out of the Shrine of Resurrection and walk straight into Ganon's castle and see if I can kill Ganon. Because that's a thing you can do in this game. It's just... It's like they took every major lesson and like new development added to open world games in the last decade and finally got in on all of it in the best way possible. Really, really can't recommend this game enough. Fantastic. That's nice. Anyways, though... Awesome, uh, that feels great for me, because I, I did buy it for you for your birthday, so... Yes, I really appreciate it. Maybe one of the best <laughs> gifts I've gotten. Anyways, though, um, <clears throat> Brandon, we were, are going to take a quick break here. Um, however, when we come back, I know you wanted to talk a little bit more about Horizon, and then we're going to get into the news. Guys, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. All right, we are back. And uh, really quick before we jump into what Brandon's been playing, I just wanted to mention... Uh, I had the epiphany on our break. Yes, I did have one negative about Zelda. I touched on it briefly before, but um, I do want to highlight that the screen tearing is a bit of an issue. There are frame drops in the game. It's not game-breaking by any means, but I want to make sure that if we're recommending the game to people, they are aware, because I know for some people, that's a deal-breaker. For me, I even as someone who's a stickler about it, I can get past it. It really doesn't bother me much, but just wanted to mention that really quick. That said, Brandon, you have been nonstop playing Horizon this week. Do you have yeah, some, this some new info for us? Yeah, this has definitely been the only game I've played this week, and I love it to death. I've played it probably about 40, probably about 
30 hours approximately. And this is mainly me running around exploring the environment. Sure. Um, the map size is what I would define as perfect. It is not, um, I don't, Henry, I don't know if Henry like, uh, like went too much detail on the map. I got a chance to look at the map on Henry's console. I think it's freaking massive. Oh, you're like, talking Zelda? Yeah. yeah it's the, the it's stupidly large. Insanely large. Like to the and, point where like walking from like the middle of it to like the far right side can take like an hour. Like it's yeah. really big. I that may be a bit maybe closer to half an hour, but it's really big to the point where you need to teleport around after a point to get anything done. Horizon Zero Dawn's map is not that big. I'd say it maybe half the size. Um Sure. But I'm kind of glad because I've gotten to a point in games where I was like, I don't need the map to be big. I just want it to have cool stuff in it. <laughs> sure. It's not so much about the size of the map. It's like what you do with the like empty space. Cause like yeah. if you, if you have like a barren wasteland, you know, you don't want to end up in a fallout situation where it feels like most of the map is empty or like how I feel about um, just cause three. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. How everyone feels about just cause three is a wasteland with like four hubs. Like fuck yeah. that. Yeah. So so just in a quick expose on the map, like you have biomes, which are like both fully, which are all fully fleshed out. So you have like your wintry wooded area, you know, kind of like, like kind of like uh, Colorado where you're in the mountains per se. Sure. Like, you know, mountainy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I snow. gotcha. Then you have your lush. I mean, then you have your desert and your desert has like different phases. So you have like your Sahara-ish desert. And then you also have like your, like like the lower left hand side of America, like Arizona desert kind of feel like they're like, it's like super sandy and then super rocky desert sure, effectively, sure. but it's like pretty like big and even like a desert to mountainous cold area. And then you have like the luscious rainforest I've ever seen in my life. Nice. Oh, That's cool. My it's nice to have yeah. a variety of locations. Yeah. And it all works and they all phase in and out. Like for example, like you hit the desert on the other side of a mountain pass, which is geographically accurate. Nice. Like, that makes sense. That's cool. Yeah, like from a science perspective, which I'm super dope, which I'm kinda like, oh, this actually makes sense. Oh, cool. Um So that's effectively the map. The map is fleshed out and the animals in the areas kind of work out too. Another thing about the enemies. So when I was talking yesterday about like what the enemies do, just disregard that because I've gotten a bit more into the story and I was completely wrong. Like they exist and the things that they are doing are for a completely different reason. Good. But it's but, super important. But, but we're going to hold off on any spoilers this week. But that's as far as I'm going. Like, yes. I'm not talking anything else cool. about that. But that is like, cool. Getting the story is just awesome. Like it is super cool. Like, like without going into any spoilers, it's just like Judgment Day. So it's like watching Terminator. And then, like, what happened a thousand years after? Nice, that? nice. All right, I'm going to cut you off because you have a habit of thinking you're oh, going to that's it. That's all I'm going to say. That's it. <laughs> so uh, what else have you uh, found as you've continued playing? Like, you say that it seems like the robots have some additional behaviors. Have you been Have you been using some additional tactics to take down said robots? Yeah, so I've gotten into it. I've effectively fought every enemy except for two. One story-based. Uh, I can talk about it because even though I've never fought it, its corpse is littered across the map. Um which is the death ringer like it's is that that big tentacle robot from the opening cutscene? no it's a super bigger version of that think of a rectangle on legs with super with a bunch of guns nice and i learned that and you learn in the game that the reason why the death ringer and the uh, other one the corruptor careful. which was on box art careful are they're they're old types they're from the old world. all right i'm gonna cut you off that's right it. now I'm no that's say... that's okay. literally let's it. talk every tactics. other robot is new except for those they're kind of just relics cool. effectively um so but i also got to see like huge huger enemies like the enemies get real big like real real big yeah how big are we talking like t-rex is like you can see him on the other side of the map like his Damn. surface detection range is a couple of miles <laughs> you can't hear him but you can see him walking around from like one side of the map to the other that's really cool i'm surprised yeah, like, they render models at like large distances that's pretty rare it, and also, like, the bigger enemies are, like, super interesting to fight. Like, I've gotten to a point where I've fought every enemies and I've started to give them pet names. Like, my, the cutest enemy is definitely, like, the show walker, which is, like, a little hermit crab. And it's <laughs> cute because it walks around with this little cargo bay, which is the hermit part of it. And he's like, yeah, man, I just have my little, my little, my little cargo store. So I blow it up. And he's like, no, 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 no. 
would he run? He doesn't even attack you after you blow off his shell. He just runs back to it and grabs it with his little gravity hand and puts it back on it and then holds it the whole time he's fighting you. I'm just like, you really want that, but I want it, though. It is my cutest enemy. The most annoying enemy is, like, your scrapper, which is kind of like your scavenger, so it's like your hyena. Sure. He's easy to kill, but they're always in squads, and it kind of annoys me. The most terrifying enemy I've fought so far um, initially was, like, the, what I call the Thunderhawk or Lightning Hawk of Doom, which is just a giant eagle that just shoots like railgun, electrified railgun shots at you while just like swooping it. It is massive. Like, I don't think you can actually dodge it. That's but I cool. found something worse. I found something more terrifying. I was riding through the desert and then something called a rock picker came out of the ground. It erupted from the ground and it was like the size of the largest enemy in the game. Or at least Jeez. it felt like it. Except it just is underground. And I ran away because I tried fighting it and was too scared to continue because you can't get close to it because it's attack. it has like a swipe attack and its other attack is literally like, I'm going to stick my head out of the ground and vomit boulders. Jesus Christ. Not, not at you, just in a full area. You can't dodge. His rule is like, I'm not going to let you dodge because I'm going to saturate an area with raining rocks. Just dude. the sky will be blotted out with rocks. Yeah, I'm just like, yeah. And then, like, not rotten right, boulders. I'm like, ah, That's oh, cool. God. But they all have specific weaknesses and are super fun to fight. I'll give you a quick example of how I fight enemies. Um, there's one animal, the first boss, effectively, you fight is a sawtooth, which is basically a saber tooth tiger. Sure. Right? And you can, and let me be very clear, this has Dark Souls levels of, like, difficulty. You cannot walk in. You walk into a fight with a bow and, like, oh, I got this, bro. You're going to die. Um, <laughs> like, it's two hits and you're dead. And sure. they vary their attacks. So I look at the environment, and I'm like, okay, I can actually make him... One thing that he will do is he will charge you. He's a melee type. So, all right, if I can get him to charge me through this gap, I can hit him with a trap. So I take out a trip wire and, like, use an elemental effect of electric on him. That's right? cool. And then, after the trap, I set up a explosion bomb to blow off some metal shards. Then I wrap around a building... And then set up another trap, which is a fire trap. And what I did was I set up an electric trap to stun him while I get the chance to set the third trap. Sure. He runs into the shrapnel trap, which blows off his armor. Then he runs into the fire trap, which lights him on fire. And fire does Damn. successful fire damage. And then while he's doing that, I just start laying him off with fire arrows to make sure that he's constantly getting AOE damage. Then I apply God damn. a... Then I, then I can't use regular arrows because they just bounce off. So then I use, like, these armor-piercing arrows, which do, like, 70 damage instead of 15. All while dodging his attacks. That is surprisingly involved. I did not realize that the combat was quite so full of depth. Although, you're playing on hard, right? Yeah, but even on... I switched to easy mode to do hunting trials, which are, like, smaller minigames games when, when you unlock weapons. That's, that's all it is. Pussy. Um, because I was having a lot of trouble. You're no fun when you don't respond. <laughs> no, I was just I was having way too much trouble because it's really hard. <laughs> it's like, I oh understand. God. I understand. I do that on occasion in games. Yeah. So even then, it's pretty involved. Like you have to be very strategic with the enemies you fight, and that's just in his case. In the case of the 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 thing that's jumping out of the ground, the rock breaker. Like my techniques are is whenever he goes out, I just throw ranged elemental attacks at him to stun him, and then I come in and do it do a critical attack on him and then run away as quick as possible because he, he once he gets up, he's going to kill me. That's like, cool. No mercy. That reminds um, me a lot of the larger enemies in Zelda too, where you're like, it's, it's, they literally will one shot you if they hit you. So you are like doing some kind of strategic, like takedown attack, hitting them like twice and then getting the fuck out of there so that you can knock them down again. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite fight by far though has been the lurker, which is like what I call stealth sniper Jaguar. The fuck? Um, because that is literally a two-stage boss fight each time. Because it starts off, he sees you, and then he immediately drops mines that's, that um, if you walk on them, they take half your health. And then we'll stay at a distance and straight up snipe you. And the sniper shots literally blow by your face. You can The way that the graphics are set up, it literally feels like they're coming right at you. That's cool. You're dodging. So you're sitting there, you guys are doing counter-sniping each other, and he's going invisible, so you can't tell exactly where he is at distance. Yeah. So you're just waiting for, like, a gleam of his eye, and you just pop a shot off, like, a foot above it to hit his sniper rifle. Once you hit off his sniper rifle, he just comes in at you. Oh, then he switches to straight-up melee? 
switch this to straight up melee and it is a dodge fest like you don't have time you set up traps at the beginning but you have no time after that <laughs> tackling him is so difficult because you're in the woods when you see him and it is attack 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 you're just dodging rolling dodging rolling getting in a light attack rolling again popping up a couple of arrows <laughs> that sounds really fun one Very, time like, i got super, yeah, i got style. a heavy attack off of him as he was coming in to swipe if he had hit me i would have been done hit him staggered him he dropped. I did a critical attack and killed him. I was like, oh, snap. I made it. <laughs> and that was just I one. love moments like that. That's the fantastic. Funny. And that was just the intro battle. That was just the game introducing you to this type of enemy. Right. They usually come in pairs. Oh, Jesus. And when you fight them in pairs, one comes in for crow's critical attacks while the other one tries to snipe you. Isn't that the worst? Isn't that the worst when, like, a game is, like, you know, in level one or two, they're like, and here's the boss of this level. And then by like level six, they're like, you enter a room. Three of the boss from that level and like are now here as regular enemies. You're yeah, like, ah, it was shit. So funny. Yeah, because it was just an introduction to a side quest. It wasn't even a boss fight. It was just like, it just feels like how I would say an old school boss fight is where you just have stages of like, right. Reminds me of Doom initially. With some of the uh, bosses in that game. Like, remember the Cyber Demon? Yes. Where you had, like, two tiers of fighting? Yeah. It's kind of like that. It's just like, oh, gosh. like It's very two... it's very Zelda boss-esque. Yeah, and it's, like, and each enemy requires a certain amount of depth. Um, you can also, like, a certain amount of depth to fight it. It's just insanity. That's really cool. Yeah, it's I'm glad fun. to hear that you're relying on your traps and stuff more now, too, because I remember last week you were saying, like, oh, I can pretty much kill everything with the bow. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You this game forces you to use traps on anything as what the game would define as medium and up. Gotcha. I think a uh, lot of people that like were doing like early impressions and stuff maybe hadn't gotten far enough. Like they had your perspective from last week where they were like, "Oh yeah, it's pretty easy. You know, the bow is really good, and like I can just use that. I don't really need any of the other nah, stuff." Then you nah. get to some of the later enemies, and it's like, "Nah, fuck you." <laughs> nah, because here's the thing: like these enemies, like medium tier and up, you can empty a whole. Your whole max, you can your max capacity for arrows is sixty, just on regular arrows and fire arrows. Everything else is thirty. You can empty out your whole, um, like your whole pot of arrows, all sixty arrows, and still have an enemy that's three quarters to half life. Damn, probably you shouldn't know? be wasting arrows on those types of enemies. Exactly. Like the first time I fought a sawtooth, the only reason why I won that fight was because I accidentally dropped a firebomb on him. As he was jumping on me, I get, I came aside and he blew up. And I'm like, how did he blow up? And I realized I set a trap. That was the only reason why I survived that fight. Nice. Like, pure luck. Uh, another thing to note, too, is, like, some of them have explosive, um, like, sacks on them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this game has no mercy. Like, usually they're coming in on you. Like, I'll blow up a sack. You take AOE damage from that. Like, Damn. It's so funny. This game has no mercy. It's like, yeah, you'll take off a chunk of his health, but you're going to lose a quarter if you're the close. And I'm just like, oh, my God, you're killing me. I had something like that happen to me, actually, in Zelda last night. I was fighting yeah. an enemy, killed him, and in his death animation, he flies up in the air and then falls down, and he squished me. Yeah. The nice thing that was fun about it, though, is that sometimes I'll down enemies and then use, like, the explosive sacks on their bodies as traps themselves. So oh, that throw, is cool. So I'll throw a rock by the body, and they'll come investigate it. And then I'll just light that thing up and it'll just blow like and there like there's a, a character called the Bellowback, which is basically like a like a bird with a giant bowl of explosive stuff on his back. Like sure. a huge thing. And it causes a massive explosion. So I use that as a tool to basically AoE smash a bunch of enemies. I actually use it in one of the corrupted zones, which is like another mini game and in it. It's kind of story based, but not really. It's pretty story based. Yeah, it, well, once you get past, like, a certain section in the game, it doesn't matter. Yes, like, but that's not... But, but we can't assume that our listeners are past that section. So. Yeah. You'll, you'll, know when, you'll know when it doesn't matter, when, if you're playing. Sure. Anyways, uh, though, so any other, uh, any other stuff you wanted to touch on here before we move on? Yeah. Um, one more thing. Um, I got to the main hub... There's two main hub cities in the game. One is where you start, the Nora which is your home clan. And then there's the other one, which is like the sun clan. I'm just going to call them that for yeah. the sake of simplicity. They have, they're like at a different phase of development. They're like at a, it's like civilization where you're like, okay, this is the hunter gatherer phase. These guys are like kind of at the Byzantine phase of existence. Like their home city is just, it's just built on top of a plateau and it just looks like a, just super cool. Something you would expect out of like a elder scrolls game. Like oh, it that's is neat. 
ornate armor. It's like a cross between like Roman centurion armor and also has like little um, is it like kind dazzles of, of uh, Japanese armor styles, just little dazzles, just accented. Is it uh, sort of Caesar's Legion style? Kind of, but not really. Gotcha. But I mean it's that like, kind of a mashup between old and new and like Roman and other. Yeah. It's kind of like you're at the point where like your clan takes bits of like robot like of machines and like literally just staples it to like leather and there's your armor. Right. Because these guys have taken the metal, beaten it, and forged their armor. Okay, gotcha. That's cool. Yeah, because I noticed like the Nora, the starting tribe, like they'll take like a robot's kneecap and just wear it as a hat, and I'm like, <laughs> you dork. <laughs> yeah, but these guys will like forge armor. Like they're kind of like at the end of the. Like getting past the Iron Age, like gotcha. toward the later in the Iron Age. Because I think it was Brown, Bronze Age and then Iron Age. Yep. And then, yeah, so their guys are like mid Iron, mid Iron Age, I would say. Nice. Like they, they, they understand basic machinery. They it's, build cannons and stuff like that. It's super dope. It's they have really, like a city with paving. I'm like, oh, crap. Like this is this is different. It's a shame we can't talk about it more, but it's really impressive the world that they've built. It's really diverse. Like I don't, I'm not going to give any specifics, but let me say like – this is a game that constantly subverts your expectations. Every time you think you know what's going on or you think you're getting an understanding of how the world that you're in works, they pull the rug out from under you again. Yeah, dude, dude this game like gave me a couple of twists and turns in the story. I will say I know where I am, and that's it. Nah, like, that's you are, It's based in like real-world Earth, and I know the location that was, but that's as far as I'm going to go. Nice. Yeah, it's it's super interesting because you're like, whoa, what happened here? And that's probably another twist in the story I'm going to find out. That's really cool. Well, I'm really glad you're enjoying it. And I'm glad that it seems to have some staying power and wasn't just a quick flash in the pan. Yeah, I can't put it down. It's kind of sad. <laughs> PlayStation yeah, well, screaming at me. We all have our vices. <laughs> PlayStation is screaming at me. Let me tell, tell them to give it a break. And my computer is like getting lonely. <laughs> like, it's just sad. Yeah, mine too right now. But don't worry. Well, there will be enough PC releases coming up this year that I'm sure we'll be giving them plenty of TLC. Yeah. Anyways, though, uh, that is going to wrap up what we've been playing this week. But we do have a little bit of news we got to get to here. Um, we got about 20 minutes left in the show, so we are going to get through this uh, as much of it as we can. Forgive me if there's anything we do not get to. We will just touch on it next week. Um, so first up, I wanted to just really briefly talk about uh, the new No Man's Sky update. Uh, you guys remember uh, a month or two ago we covered uh, <clears throat> the first big free update where they rolled out customizable base building, um, ha- the sort of space station um, t- uh, space station stuff. Uh, a bunch of, like, home planet features, a lot of quality of life stuff, and a couple of the features that were missing at launch. Um, right. Now we have our second big update, and this one has added quite a few more features in. Uh, this one is featuring PS4 Pro support, of course, uh, permadeath, online base sharing, uh, land er, and land vehicles, which is pretty cool. Like, that's a pretty big thing, especially the vehicles part, because there were no land vehicles. Also rumored that you're able to own multiple spaceships. This is a pretty big deal. I still can't recommend this game. I don't know if I'll ever be able to really recommend this game. We'll see. But I have to say, I got to give credit where credit's due. Hello Games has done more post-launch development than I ever expected of this title. Yeah, well, here's the thing. If they keep it up, they might actually have a game on their hands. Yeah, no kidding. Instead of a really fancy you know, proof of concept. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I agree with you completely there. My suggestion is the same as yours. Like, I cannot in good conscience su- suggest this game. I enjoyed it to an extent when I, you know, but I still don't think it's good. If updates continue at the current pace, I'd say this game may, like, be the kind of thing that I could recommend picking up on a sale in a year, year and a half. But I think it's going to depend on if they continue to add in new content and stuff like that. Yeah, but I agree there too. If they can, if they get a couple, if they can do a, two or three more updates over the course of this year, I might be able to say, yeah, you can find it for twenty. Exactly, yeah. and that's live now. So if you do have the, uh, <clears throat> if you do actually have the game and you've been waiting to check it out, you know, you can always jump in now to see what the new features are. Yeah, and if you have it on PC and you haven't like deleted it from your Steam database, <laughs> you know. I'm certainly how do I it. how do I permanently get rid of a game I purchased? <laughs> yeah, this yeah because I'm still very much on the rails for this. I enjoyed the time I played, but 
that does by no means make it a good game. Sure. And, you know, everybody has different preferences, too. I know there are some people who are huge fans, and for them, uh, that's why we make sure we cover all these updates, because for them, this could be huge. No, yeah, I love it. It's just a principal thing for me. Like, I love what I played, but at the same time, like, professionally, like, from a standpoint of if suggesting and, like, yeah. the overall encompassing of it. No, I, I, I get you. Yeah. Yeah, I would hold off, like, maybe forever. <laughs> maybe forever. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, next up, we have another update. Uh, this is another. This is a more anticipated one, though. Uh, PlayStation 4.5's big update is live. Uh, this is the one that's featuring the PlayStation Boost Mode support for the Pro. Uh, that is the new mode that they are rolling out. That it's not like they're not really supporting it, but they're adding in the option in a lot of old games, not all. Uh, to be able to use the full, theoretically use the full processing power of the uh, PlayStation Pro versus the original PS4. So basically what it would do is you can play certain older games and it'll hopefully bump up the frame rate a bit or it'll just kind of smooth out a lot of like uh, frame drops and stuff like that. Overall, it's just meant to generally improve the quality on some of these games. That said... Apparently, it really breaks a lot of stuff, too. So <laughs> don't, uh, you know, I ne- wouldn't necessarily buy a PS4 Pro just for the boost mode, but definitely something that I'd recommend playing around with if you have a PS4 Pro and, you know, a, a library of titles you can pop in and check out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know. Sounds pretty solid. Brandon, I know you're thinking about getting a Pro in the not too distant future. Uh, just out of curiosity, how does this new feature uh, affect your perception of the Pro? As, well, like, good. a potential consumer. Um, here's the thing. Like, especially after playing No Man's uh, not No Man's Sky. Uh, oh, God, that game's stuck in my head now. Um, playing Horizon. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Honestly, if... the only I stand by what I said early on when I first started talking about this. If you do not have the peripherals that are going to support, fully support the PlayStation's new hardware, the HDR stuff, and, or, you know, didn't don't didn't just hold off. Really? So that. you wouldn't want to see, like, a slightly better looking version? That's interesting to me coming from somebody who, like, has, like, a top-of-the-line computer. Like, you would not – you you wouldn't be interested in playing Horizon with, like, slightly better graphics, frame rates, and, like, you know, resolution? Well, here's the thing. It's still going to be capped at around 30. Um, sure, but it would it. dip less and stuff like that. Yeah, but here's the thing. It's barely noticeable on this. Okay, right. sure. I mean, with yeah. some games, though, isn't it going to be unlocking the frame rate? Yeah, but when you do stuff like that, you come up with your own set of problems. Sometimes. Yeah. But so yeah, you're right. Sometimes, like, like cutscenes will run at double speed or stuff like that when you unlock it. Yeah, but if you're an average consumer, because here's the thing. you're gonna If you're going to buy something new, there has to be a new cell, and that new cell is the HDR tech at the end of the day it's funny that you say that to me like you're the only person i know who's even brought up the hdr tech like i didn't even know that was a thing it's cool that it's in there but i feel like for most people the the because that was is... the whole cell initially you were like oh you can watch games better really if you I, have this television. I thought that the cell was like you can yeah. actually play the games that are released on this console because we've had some game like I, I think of it like more of a you know the last of us on ps3 versus the last of us remastered on ps4 no, it's not. It's completely different. Because I was actually following this because I was seriously considering buying one. Sure. And then I realized that when it comes down to it, you plug your PS4, you plug your PS4 Pro to the same television that you're using your regular PS4 on. It was going to look effectively exactly the same. And at wow. most, you're going to be getting maybe ten frames at on like the high end of a difference. Sure. You're not going to get fair enough. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of like. Yeah, you do. If you don't have a PlayStation console and you're looking at getting one, get the Pro because it's effectively the same cost as what I paid for my PlayStation. Right, right. So, yeah, definitely get the Pro, even if you don't have the peripherals. But if you're upgrading from the PlayStation 4 to the PlayStation 4 Pro and you do not have the adequate peripherals for it, then you're upgrading for, you know, for like a very minimal thing because you shouldn't have to pay upwards of $200. For like a couple of extra frames, unless you are playing competitively. Fair enough. That's actually a pretty good point. I guess it's not quite like getting a new graphics card for a PC because it's not like that measurable of a difference. It's you're saying it's maybe been hyped as making a bigger difference than it really does. Well, yeah, that's what the major problem is. As a matter of fact, even Sony, 
and even uh, Microsoft have said the same thing. It's really hard to market a product where the majority of people can't tell the difference because they're looking at 1080p screens. Sure. Now, I've seen HDR, and it looks awesome. Like, I've gone to Best Buy, I've gone to GameStop, I've seen it, it looks great. However, I'm not willing to spend, like, the amount of money it would cost, because you got to remember, if you're upgrading to a PS4, you, you're going to get probably $150 for your PlayStation for to upgrade to the PS4, which just costs like $400. So you're going to pay effectively 250 300 bucks for your PS4, right? You're going to get the new controllers because they have the fancy light bar. It's something you're going to do because you're a console player. Um, sure. <laughs> that's just how it works. Then you got to buy a new HDR television, and you're not going to buy like a 20-inch one. You're probably going to buy a 30- or 40-inch one. That's going to run you between six and $800. <laughs> Fair enough. I you guess know, I'm not, not taking everything it fully it into. You you're right. I'm <laughs> yeah. not taking all the details into account. Well, I appreciate you setting me straight because I, I don't always necessarily know what to think about some of these, uh, you know, console mid these new console mid generation upgrades. It's just a weird situation, especially yeah, no. from. Let the me tell you what my PC actual. Gamer. Ironically, let me tell you what my like real crutch point was at this point because I was thinking about upgrading it again like two weeks ago. My crutch point, which kind of sold, turned me off to it, too, was, well, I just finished setting up my new screen setup for my computer, and my PlayStation's corner, the right corner of my PlayStation sits right under the screen, and it has, like, an inch clearance. The new PlayStation Pro is a little bit taller, and I wouldn't be able to fit it under the screen so snugly, so I would have to move my PlayStation two inches to the left. <laughs> and that that kind of broke the deal for me. Let's like, be honest, the aesthetics minor. are the real reason. Yeah, that's literally it, like minor aesthetics. Because at this point, if you don't have, if you're going to buy one, my suggestion would get a get a television first. Get the uh, HDR television. Get that experience and, and then buy the PlayStation Pro. Because the PlayStation is going to enhance the HDR experience overall. Fair enough. Because ultimately, since the PlayStation 4 came out, this is the pinnacle of 1080p that you're going to get on the console. Yeah. Moving to HDR is like an accoutrement to 4K and QHD televisions. That's where it's really going to matter. So if you don't have a 4K or QHD or HDR television, there's no real reason to purchase the PS4 Pro unless you just don't have a PlayStation console at all. Sure. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, you... Because... It, at this point, for me, if I were to buy a PlayStation Pro, it would just simply be so that I have more longevity out of the console. That totally makes sense. I get that. And who knows? Maybe towards the end, you'll see games that have more of a meaningful difference when they're designed for the Pro, and then like they are running maybe a little worse on the original one. I think towards the end of the generation, it'll make a bigger difference. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be an interesting one, too, because one of the, 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 one of the bedrock things that they said, the requirements for all games, is that it has to run on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro. So I'm interested to see how long that standard lasts. Um, I don't know. I might get an HDR television at the end of this year and then maybe upgrade to the Pro. My suggestion really ultimately for anybody is just wait for the slim model because it will sure. be cheaper and probably more efficient. Yeah, that's always smart is waiting for those revisions they do. Yeah, because especially if you already have a PlayStation 4 because then you're missing out on the least. Yeah. You know? Cool. That, that makes sense to me. Um, hey, I got to keep us moving because we got about 10 minutes left uh, and we have a couple more stories. So I want to jump into the new Overwatch champion that is on the PTR now. Oh, yeah, I saw her. She's weird. It's a her, right? Yeah. Her name is Arisa and she is being called an anchoring tank. She's basically like a support tank. It's really weird. She's like a mashup of... I don't know, like Reinhardt, Zarya, Zarya. And, well, Reinhardt, Zarya, and Anna, weirdly. So her move set is kind of strange. She's got like a long range primary fire. A her secondary fire is like a minimal version of Zarya's ultimate. So it like it's like a gravity well that pulls people to it. But it's more for, like, uh, in this case, it's less for, like, setting up, you know, giant team ultis and more for, like, you can pull people out of cover and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then in addition to that, she has uh, several, like, sort of support style moves. She has um, protective barriers that uh, will absorb 900 damage that she can place on allies. Uh, and it actually curves around them, which is pretty cool. It's not just, like, a wall in front of them. Um 
honestly, she seems really, really cool. She seems like a total, totally fun champion. Oh, and if you're wondering what my Ana comparison was, her ultimate is a supercharger move. Um, it's weird. It's a device. It's actually a physical device that is in the map and can be destroyed by the enemy team. And the reason for that is that it actually buffs the attack damage of your entire team in a huge range. I guess not necessarily your entire team, but everyone on your team within a massive radius. And the enemy team can take it out to end that buff early. Which I think is a really cool new dynamic. I think that is really, really neat. Um, oh, it's also worth noting that that, uh, that move, I think it's called Halt, that ability that pulls people around uh, corners or whatever, uh, can also be used to move Bastion while anchored. Oh, yeah. Uh, this seems like a really cool champion, uh, and I'm really excited to check her out once she hits live. I'm not really much of a PTR player, but I'm excited to see another tank, honestly. I, I feel like uh, I like these kind of hybrid role tanks that can maybe dish out a fair amount of damage, but also are not like, you know, you can't just run around like Reinhardt with a hammer smash and everything. <laughs> It's cool. I, I don't know. I like off tanks. I, I'm not pure tanks are kind of boring, but off tanks are always fun and interesting to play, especially when you can add in some support. It's like a half a tank, a ta, so to speak. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you GTA three reference in case anybody's wonder. <laughs> All right. Um, next up, we'll talk more about. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We'll talk more about Arisa once she is live in the main mode. Um, one more story-ish thing we wanted to talk about here before we finish up is the Switch news that was coming out. Specifically, there are two big things I wanted to highlight. One of these is a major concern to me, and that is Switch at the moment does not have any way to back up or transfer saves to another console or external drive. See, uh, Henry, um, if I had known this in advance, I probably would have suggested you not buy that console. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like sure. that's really important. Well, it's worth noting that the official so the official quote from Nintendo was at this time it is not possible to transfer save data from one Nintendo Switch to another. That is some very lawyer sounding speak that to me translates to we haven't rolled the feature out yet. I hope they roll it out in like the next week. Sure. I mean, it's worth noting you could you could transfer save data and stuff on the Wii U as well as the 3DS. So it would be really weird if they did lock this out. I would assume it would be some kind of weird anti piracy measure, but it really just seems kind of stupid and like it's just a missing feature. Um, but yeah, it's something to keep in mind, I guess, if you're accident prone and may need to replace your Switch or if you intend to, you know, buy a new one and sell off your old one at any time. Um, just make sure that that feature, if it is going to be, has rolled out. Because if not, that could really suck to lose, especially in something like Zelda, where it's like such a huge game to lose all that progress. Um, yeah, it's just like, oh, the thought is insanity. Yeah, it's nuts. So yeah, we'll let you guys know as soon as that is added in, because I will most certainly be backing up all my game data. Oh, also, it's worth noting, you. This this is almost a bigger downside. Because you can't transfer save data... Um, and save data has to be stored on your internal memory. It cannot be on your SD card expandable memory. If mm-hmm. you fill up your entire internal memory with save data, which given might be a little difficult, but let's say maybe you have a couple of uh, you know, eShop games on there as well, you actually mm-hmm. have to delete stuff off there to create new saves. What? Yeah, like you can't just start making new saves on the external card. They have to be on the internal one, at least for now. So... Definitely something to keep in mind if you're considering the Switch. I don't think it's a deal breaker personally. I don't really transfer save data on consoles very often. But that said, you know, I know for some people this could be an issue. So just wanted to throw it out there. Uh, That's good to know, man. Yeah, absolutely. But like I said, the way that they phrased their response, I wouldn't be surprised if we see this in the next year or so. Okay. Uh, Yeah, it just made me a little nervous when I heard it. I was like, (laughs) definitely, definitely. Uh, the other big Switch news story that people are talking about, and this is actually a couple stories rolled into one, is there have been reports of quite a few hardware issues with the Nintendo Switch. Um, specifically, the most common ones have been left Joy-Con connectivity problems, 
this is where your left Joy-Con will become will come unpaired, and it forces you to do the pairing sequence, which you have to tap L and R at the same time on the controller and then press A. But uh, it definitely can be a pain in the ass when you're actually trying to do something in the middle of a game. Uh, yeah, I can see that being an issue. There have also been reports of crashes, loud noises, dead pixels, uh, bad Wi-Fi, which I talked about myself. Some people claim overheating, uh, wrist straps getting stuck, flickered screens, docks being uh, docks scratching consoles when they're being uh, set inside them. <clears throat> and it's worth noting that of all of these, the only one I've ever experienced is the terrible Wi-Fi signal. Um, I have put this thing through the paces. Not once have I had any heating issues. I've felt the fan go before. It definitely has a fan inside that's blowing out air, but it's in extremely graphically intensive areas, usually when I've been playing for ages and when it's outputting HDMI. So, you know, it is what it is. Also, it's in a, you know, a heated room. I feel like the overheating thing may be based on, like, location and stuff like that. Um, but besides that, I haven't experienced any of this. I've had zero crashes. Uh, I haven't had any issues with dead pixels. No flickering of any kind. My screen has not been scratched by my dock. Though I will say, the pl- the rubber slash plastic protectors that are in here to quote-unquote protect the screen, I, c- I couldn't necessarily see them scratching it with normal use, but I could see that if you are, like, dropping it in, gravity could scratch you know, pull it across it hard enough to scratch it. Then again, I'd say if you're dropping your switch into the dock, you're an idiot because the dock is just a piece of plastic with a with a USB-C adapter sticking out of it. So you're just going to break that thing if you do it like that. Um, no issues with wrist straps that I've had, but people are reporting them. It's worth noting that this happens every launch. You get a wave of reports, and it usually turns out that the vast majority of them are like 12 really vocal people. Uh... I don't know. I I know at least four people who have switches. No, five. And no one has reported any of these issues except for I've seen a little bit with the left Joy-Con connectivity problems. Um, And hilariously, Nintendo actually released some guidelines on how to fix the connectivity issues. Uh, Here is the official quote from Nintendo. When using the Joy-Con controllers wirelessly, the characters seem to move on their own or do not respond correctly. Uh, When used wirelessly, they respond intermittently, or they appear to lose connection with the console. So these are, sorry, these are the behaviors. This is their fixes. Try to decrease the distance to the console. Ensure that the Switch console is placed to minimize interference, so the console shouldn't be behind a TV, near an aquarium, I don't know what the fuck that's about, placed in or under a metal object, pressed against a large amount of wires or cords, within three to four feet of another wireless device, such as a wireless speaker or wireless access point. And then they also say, check for uh, interference that could be caused by cell phones, wireless headsets, wireless printers, microwaves, wireless speakers, cordless phones, USB 3.0 compatible devices, such as thumb drives. In most cases, they say, it will be enough to move them three to four feet away from the Nintendo Switch console. However, if you continue to experience the issue, please turn them off while using the Switch. Yeah, Nintendo, get the fuck out of here. What, the, you, what, I can't have a USB 3.0 compatible thumb drive close That's to weird. it? They must mean plugged in or something. I can't imagine. I have no idea. What, has it got, what does 3.0 have to do with anything? What, is 2.0 okay? Also, what you can't have wireless headsets within three to four feet of the console? Fucking What? Yeah, that sounds weird. Uh, this sounds like a total bullshit like list of fixes. I can't imagine any of these would actually help except for don't put it under metal. I don't know what the aquarium thing is. Yeah. And that's also, <laughs> as a rule of thumb, just you let should... you know, like my silence was confusion if there was a bit, yeah. and I heard something about like aquarium, like it was. I have no fucking idea about that. But I think most important one, and this is true of all vi- devices that have cables that carry video signals. You guys, you cannot bundle video cables with electrical cables. It's called yes, capacitance, a- and it will fuck with your signal. Cannot blame a manufacturer because you don't know how to wire your stuff properly. Yeah, Make sure I, that I your video cable is very, not, like, zip-tied or anything to your fucking power cable. Because electricity doesn't work that way. <laughs> Anyways, though. To be uh, fair, like, I didn't understand wiring until, you know. 
I built my first computer. Yeah. So let me be very clear there. Like I can understand why you would be confused. That said, that is a, out of all of these, that's the most real uh, fix is is the other thing I wanted to highlight. That and it being like underneath a piece of metal, you idiots. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. <clears throat> Nintendo has laughable fixes that they've listed. Hopefully, this is something, though, that can be fixed in a firmware update. I don't, I'm not totally sure because I haven't watched any breakdowns of the Switch yet, but I'm not totally sure what kind of technology, wireless technology, it's using to communicate with the system. I assume it's not Bluetooth considering that range seems to be somewhat limited, maybe a custom branch or something like that. But, yeah, uh, it does seem odd that there's connectivity issues that some, that a lot of people are having. And while I've been lucky enough not to have them, possibly because I play at a computer screen, so I'm much closer to my console, um, they're definitely a thing that people are experiencing. And I hope that it's something that can be patched out rather than something that requires getting the next model of Switch to get taken care of. Yeah. That's, yeah, uh, at least half of them. Like, the Wi-Fi thing looks like it could be a firmware update. If the If the left controller continually on pairs for you you don't want to buy a new switch and you are you know really really frustrated and want to keep playing zelda you can always buy a pro controller they apparently do not have these issues because it's worth noting it's only the left joy con which i think is the one that doesn't have like the gyroscope and stuff like that in it uh that's the only one that comes disconnected the right one with the majority of the technology and it stays connected which means that if you're using a single united piece like the pro controller that's a non-issue Okay, that's good. But uh, yeah, um, that is pretty much going to do it for this week's episode. Um, As I'm sure you guys can tell, this show has been procedurally generated. We hope you've enjoyed listening. Please be sure to check us out on Libsyn and iTunes where you can leave a rating or review. Or if you prefer to watch on YouTube, you can check out the latest episode on my channel, lesser.noob, that's N-0-0-B. Or you can just search for Henry Plays. You can also follow us on Twitter at PG underscore show. Thank you guys so much for listening, and as always, game on.